Welcome back to another edition of our After Hours Screen Talk. I'm Dan. With me, as always, is Tenian. Uh, today, we're going to discuss Fede Alvarez's 2013 remake of Evil Dead. This film opened in 2013 to positive reviews for the most part. Uh, it did solid box office and established Alvarez as a director of note, not only as a director of horror, but also a stylish director of generally engaging and gripping genre pieces. We'll do our usual thing. There will be a spoiler portion of this video, but first we're going to engage in a non-spoiler review. We will cue you to that. To begin with the non-spoiler portion, the film sticks pretty close to the original plot, but it adds additional human drama. Whereas the original featured a bunch of friends at a cabin who were just there to party and hang out, this one features Mia, a uh, heroin-addicted young woman, and her brother David. They are there at a family cabin, there with friends specifically so that Mia can try to get clean, kick the habit. Uh, so the occasion for being there is not to party, but to actually get clean and, and hopefully turn uh, turn a corner in her life. The film also adds a layer of family trauma. There is a, a theme of mental illness and insanity. David and Mia's mom, through one form or another, she loses her mind. That's sort of haunting uh, Mia. That's That's the reason for her drug use. So the film is different in that way, but otherwise sticks very close to the original film's emphasis on what Raimi termed grueling horror. While this film features Fede Alvarez as director, new screenwriters, it is actually still produced by Sam Raimi, Rob Tapper, and their production company. So it happened with their full approval and still acting as strong creative influences on the production end of things. I love the emphasis on practical effects, and mm -hmm. Alvarez really makes a point of doing the hard work of using practical effects. He's going to be helming Elaine Romulus, or has helmed it. The movie's coming out soon, and he has the same approach to that movie, really going back to the practical effects. I mean, it does make a difference when you actually have actual gore on screen. There's just not a computer effect. I was really surprised to find that there's a, it, the film is composed of 100% practical effects. The only CGI in the film is for so-called touch-ups in post-production. Kudos to Alvarez and the, the rest of the crew for taking the, the time and then having the discipline to do that. The film feels really gritty and gory in a way that it wouldn't if it were heavier on CGI. Yeah, yeah. What makes it an Evil Dead movie is Raimi's very distinct style and mm -hmm. also his tone, too, that he brings to it, that horror comedic tone, which is the comedy element, the uh, comedic factor here is is completely gone and they make it much more serious and gritty but but i think it's you know trying to imitate that style because it knows Raimi's style is so much in the dna of evil dead and it wouldn't feel like evil dead if he didn't have that stylistic stamp on it that Raimi brought to it yeah and i and i think it, at, le at least in one instance i think that that the copying of the style is really essential so i'm thinking in particular of that first person tracking shot through the woods that's supposed to invoke the idea that, that a, a demonic entity is rushing through the woods uh imminently going to possess somebody uh it's one of the the signature uh effects of the franchise is one of the really unique effects i think in in horror films so so and good it, so so good it really would have it really would have felt odd if if we hadn't had that in in this uh, this remake. It's see, I think that one feels essential to me, and it doesn't feel like just like hollowly, co hollowly copying it too. It's like it's as essential a trope as any of the you know the narrative elements, like the Book of the Dead. The characters are are you know kind of basic, fairly two dimensional horror types, uh, but I still care about them, and, and especially Jane Levy as uh, Mia. I root for her, and I think she's a great heroine uh, yeah. for at the end of the film. I. Uh, think for the characters like eric was my personal favorite just because yeah, you know, he actually mm -hmm. was tuned into what was going on when no one else was and everyone else was kind of making dumb choices and that kind of goes into one of my criticisms of the film i respect that attempt to bring in the human drama and make something more out of the characters does it work for me i don't think it quite gets there 
for me to emotionally invest in those characters because even with uh, Mia, the contrived plot points that lead to some bad choices on her character's part, you know, it's like, why are you doing this? Now I get, you know, your withdrawal maybe making you crazy and, you know, making you do stupid choices. And of course, you know, taking, doing heroin, you know, that's not a, a great life decision, right? So it makes sense that her character would be making other bad decisions, you know, in the moment. But so that, I guess that does kind of make a certain organic sense to her character. But for some of the other characters too, like that whole idea that they're going and isolating themselves in this cabin in the middle of nowhere, and that they can't leave it until she's been through her withdrawal period. And all of the characters are like, you know, doubling down on that, even when like really disturbing stuff is happening and being unearthed in the house. Like you got to get away from this place. But they're saying, no, no, we can't. We got to finish and be there for our friend and get her through her withdrawal. And we're not leaving. We're not calling the well, cops. We're not, we're not going to the hospital. We're, no, we're not taking her to the ER. We're staying right here, you know? <laughs> well, this, this is where the camp, the campiness comes in, right? Yeah. They're still very recognizably in a horror film, a, a typical kind of uh, grindhouse horror scenario where they're, they're, you know, they're really kind of stupid people at a certain point. And the whole setup is absurd. I mean, Olivia, one of, the, one of their friends, is a nurse in training, and she's supposed to be in charge of Mia's care while she's in withdrawal. And then the, the notion that a nurse in training would think, yeah, let's take her out into the middle of the woods, isolated, um, you know, as opposed to like a medical facility where they're going to have all these resources on hand and, you know, therapy and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, the conceit is she's got all the medication and everything. But still, I mean, the setup is, is the premise, if you if you scrutinize it for more than, you know, 30 seconds is pretty absurd. The film is is has, is a layered viewing experience in that way. You can watch it as a work of pure, gritty, grimy horror. But then it would be very easy to to watch this with friends and and just have a big old camp fest with it. Right. Because the setup is still very broad. Right. You've, you've got these these teenagers in the woods in a cabin. Uh, you, you've got them doing things that, you know, at least in one instance are very stupid. Don't, don't open up this book. Don't start reading these, these, you know, these words. The film works equally well on those two registers, which I think speaks to its credit. But mostly it's, it's just a, a really deftly handled formulaic horror film. And I love that for it. You know, it's, it doesn't need to be a masterpiece. It doesn't need to be anything special. What it is, is a film that I can turn on any given Friday night uh, and watch and enjoy the hell out of. And I can't say that about just any set, you know, any film, certainly any horror film. So yes. Alvarez and company did a great job. Yeah, yeah. I think it is really well skillfully executed and it ends with like a great set piece and it ends with a bang. I think it works within the Evil Dead franchise. You know, the scares, the gore and emphasis on the practical effects. That's what really sells it for me. I mean, all those mm -hmm. things are so, so good and well executed and it makes it very entertaining and a good time. So we're going to segue into the spoiler portion, just to look a little closer at specific plot points and set pieces. Going back to like the Book of the Dead, one of the things I think is interesting about the way this film revises the lore is that that I think it's suggested at least that that book's origins are not so ancient. In the original one, it's like this you know archaeologist who's come to the the cabin to like study the book with his wife, right? And they found it and like you know, he found it in some Mesopotamian dig, right? Um, so it's this ancient thing, but like there's there's a prologue sequence in in this film where you've got these Appalachian like hillbillies with the book. And they're like helping this father track down and eventually, you know, ritualistically destroy his daughter who has been possessed by one of the spirits or by the unclean spirit. And so like what's interesting for me there is that, you know, if this thing is, is has ancient origins, this book, um, it's at least been updated and messed with by these hill people who've, you know, who've like made annotations and additions to it, added things to it. So like there's there's like the more formal writing, but then people have also written things like kill, 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 burn, burn, burn. He's like, don't read it. Don't say it. Don't think it. You know, so those are also, you know, so the idea that the book has been edited and annotated like, you know, by these desperate, frantic people in this 
this rural hill setting. I think that's one of the reasons the, the, the book looks the way it does. It doesn't necessarily look very ancient because I think that a lot of the things, the suggestion is a lot of the things are kind of like newer things put there by, by people who, who are actually still alive and are somehow aware of this ancient evil. That's interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So it's a new era. It's kind of a new, or, not, if not a new origin story for the book, it's at least a, a new way that we encounter the book in the, uh, in the new film. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in the original movies, it says the book of the dead was bound in human flesh and inked in human blood. Mm -hmm. And that it's this corporeal, you know, very material object that, you know, exists in time, you know, like a body is as, you know, susceptible to being tampered with, molded, evolves like, you know, a organic body would. So, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, the way that the film revises things is really interesting. Now, one of the things it keeps is the emphasis on a gory good time. So we hinted at the, the, the gory set pieces in this film, and I think it really delivers on them. It's I wouldn't, it's not quite as grueling and outrageous as the original film, I will say. It's a little cleaner. The favorite scene in this film for both of us is probably the same scene. And I'm thinking of the one involving Olivia's possession. Olivia. Oh my God. Yeah. Her character. Yeah. That was disgusting. And then uh, Eric has a horrifying encounter with her in the bathroom involving that hypodermic needle. And also the fact that she breaks the glass of the bathroom mirror and starts cutting on herself, shaving away the layers of skin and even muscles so that we you know, we get to like see part of her jawbone. One of the things that these demons do is they engage in various forms of mutilation to torture and humiliate their human host. And then the, the way she goes to town on Eric, right? I mean, just like wailing on him with this hypodermic needle, almost piercing one of his eyes. Yeah. The scene is just gripping, gory deliciousness. And it's it's the kind of scene that that I watch like this because it's almost like I feel like I'm going to get the hypodermic needle in my own dang eye. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's lots of fun. Yeah, I mean, in those scenes, you see like you know characters who you know they're not homicidal, they're not murderers. You know, they're regular people like you and I. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they get in these circumstances, these like survival situations where it's either me or you and like Eric in that scene and like he doesn't hesitate you know he's pushed oh. to that level of desperate survival that even though you know this was a former friend of his who's now become evil and demonically possessed but still I mean looks enough like her you know despite her disfigured face you know but he does not hesitate he just like keeps like you know basically bludgeons her to death so Oh yeah, and there's, yeah. It's the film doesn't really dwell on like the idea of like, oh, what is it to take a life? Which I mean, I think that would ruin the movie. It's not that kind of movie, right? And and it, it's in perfectly in keeping with the original Raimi movies because mm. like you know Ash, the Bruce Campbell character, is constantly you know murdering his possessed girlfriends. He's fighting his evil doppler gang doppelgangers coming out of the mirror, and of course, Olivia when she becomes possessed has that gesture towards that mirror scene in the original movie uh, where, yeah. you know, Olivia sees her evil doppelganger, you know, staring out at her. And then that's when the moment of possession happens. So, um, and mm. then, yeah. And the doppelganger theme keeps, keeps going in this movie. You know, they just run with that. So, <laughs> yeah. And I, I thought like the, the demon Mia that, that, that you know the the unpossessed Mia keeps seeing off in the woods prior to her actual possession yeah. is really effective, right? The idea of this strange spectral entity in the woods that manifests itself as you know a dark version of you. Having said that, back to the storytelling. See, one of the things I also thought was really great about uh, this film is I love the I love the abomination, uh, the the ultimate manifestation of the doppelganger, right? It's yeah. It's, Mia's twin that, you know, manifests in the flesh, comes out of the ground, and then she has this terrific final girl showdown with it. Yeah, it, it's it's such a great finale when she, like, shoves this chainsaw into, uh, impels her doppelganger's, like, uh, face, and, mm -hmm. oh my god, and it's done in silhouette, so you don't see completely everything, but still awfully yeah. gory, 
and the way the body's like shaking, you know, like, oh, like it, it was really, really gross out. Uh, and at the time, it was for a mainstream horror film, like one of like kind of the grossest, you know, gruesome scenes I'd seen in a mainstream horror film at that time. Yeah, and and I like one of the best things about that whole scene too is that the world at that point is literally drenched in blood because of the realization of the prophecy. Um, yeah, it's raining blood from the sky. So Mia is drenched. The abomination is drenched. The 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 ground is literally sopping wet with blood, and she's covered into it head to toe. She looks like she's almost like becoming a kind of blood soaked creature herself. It's a great scene, really memorable. So, uh, having watched this movie and Alvarez, you know, taking over a, a horror franchise, what do you think or expect or hope for in his his Alien movie that's coming out soon? Yeah, no, I mean, of course, and that that was the occasion for our reviewing this, right? We wanted yeah. to talk about Alvarez's directorial debut now that he's getting a chance to helm an, an Alien film. I'm stoked because I think one of the things that uh that's been lacking in the last couple of alien franchise films that i've seen has been a distinct individual style uh you know a memorable stamp and that's one of the things that set the the great films in the franchise apart you had ridley scott do the first one and that's one of the most visually fantastic horror films you'll ever see and then james cameron came on and did aliens and that's one of the great action films you'll ever see, claustrophobic, unique kind of like visual flair that that he can bring to that. Yeah, uh, they you know, and and like the other films, I think are worthy too. I think I think Alien Three is is underrated. David Fincher, I obviously love him as a director. Everyone makes film fun of of Alien Resurrection, but I kind of have a a soft spot in my heart for it. Uh, I like the director of that film. Um, I get why people hate it and why they think it's funny. Uh, but I'd like to see I'd like to see the franchise return to its roots of trying to do something a little different each time because none of the none of the original alien films they don't look like each other right they never become generic even when when I think it passes from you know try and you know the first two films are masterpieces and the the films that come after that are all flawed in one way or another but they always look unique and I think that the, the franchise has gotten away from that a little bit. So hopefully yeah. with Alvarez, we'll get that back a little of that because I, he definitely does have a stamp as a director. I hope they let him keep that, right, with, with this big budget material that he has to work with. So this has been our After Hours Screen Talk. Uh, I'm Dan. This is Tenian. Hope you've enjoyed this one. We certainly intend to see Alien Romulus. Uh, maybe you do too. But in any case, like and subscribe and uh, be checking YouTube because new content is coming your way.